Hello and welcome everyone to the NYSCP Developments in Safeguarding uh, Masterclass. It's just gone 12 o'clock. I'm sure there'll be more people that'll be uh, joining us later, but um, I'm delighted to be able to tell you today we've got uh, Adam Farrow from the North Yorkshire Fire Rescue Service and Claire Allison and Dan Fox from the Regional Cyber Crime Unit uh, to come and talk to us. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just putting your uh, details in the a chat box so that we know who is here. Um, this is just to let you know for everybody's benefit, just please be aware of any environmental noise that might be going on around you. And if you can, can you please mute your microphone? Um, the session is being recorded. So if you wouldn't mind also just turning off any video cameras, we will edit the video later so that um, no uh, video of anybody is actually seen. Um, and if you have any questions, please do. Uh, add uh, those questions to the chat as well um, just so that if you have anything that you want to raise with anybody so uh, in the well uh, just another piece of housekeeping as well all of our master classes are recorded and um, we'll make the slides available from our website uh, but also they'll go on to our YouTube channel uh, we do ask that people um, please sign up to our YouTube channel for want of a, a better way of sounding like a normal YouTube sort of presenter these days. But it really does help the channel if you subscribe to it and also if you like the videos. But the reason why subscription is important is we need to get over a certain number before we can actually name the channel the num uh, and a certain number of subscribers. So if you wouldn't mind just subscribing to our channel, that would be great. And plus, you'll get notifications of our latest uh, masterclasses and other videos as they come out. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to just hand over uh, to Adam, who's going to talk to us about uh, Safe and Well. Um, thank you, Adam. If you want to start presenting over me, I'm quite happy for that. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Aidan, um, and uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Adam Farrow. I'm a watch manager for North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, and my job role is uh, specifically around prevention. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about um, FISE, um, me presenting. Hopefully that's come up on screens. Yep, yeah, we've got you there. Thank you. Brilliant. Right. OK, yeah. and I'll uh, I'll keep this to uh, time as best as I possibly can. OK, so um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we call fire risk factors. Um, Above every fire and rescue service, there's an organisation called the National Fire Chiefs Council. Um, it used to be called something else, it used to be called the Chief Fire Officers Association, but what they do is they do national studies, they do national pieces of work, and they release national best practice and guidance. Uh, and recently they've released a person-centred framework where after about five years of research, they've looked at the common characteristics that people have if they've had a fire injury or have died, perished, uh, passed away following a house fire. So I'm going to put some fire risk factors up here that um, you may see that you may tick one or two of these boxes. Um, but if you if we're aware of anyone or we we see anyone that ticks pretty much all of them or nearly all of them, we would class them as a higher risk towards fire. So um, being over 65, um, children under 11, but especially under five, being male is one of them, um, so males are adversely affected by fires. People who smoke, and that includes cigarettes, tobacco pipes, um, e-cigarettes. People who live in low socioeconomic status. Um, people who are disabled or have a long-term health condition. People who are mentally or physically impaired um, by the use of alcohol or drugs, and that obviously is from a, a low level to a substance misuse level. People who live in a non-owned property or a mobile home, single parent families and households with more than one children, people who live alone and people that have a lack of fire safety knowledge, uh, most prevalently in the sort of age group of 40 to 49. So where previously you may have seen some advertising campaigns that go out and say fire doesn't discriminate, it could get any of us. Really, I'm here today to sort of tell you that it does. Unfortunately, fire does discriminate. The statistics prove that you're more likely to have uh, be injured or killed in a fire if if you have a lot of these fire risk factors. 
um, and like I say, fire does discriminate and it picks on the most vulnerable within our societies. And I've put a picture there, it's not a great picture, um, it's not from any particular case there, but it's just to sort of show you the devastating effects that a fire can cause to domestic say. <clears throat> So um, obviously we're massively concerned about that and um, we would like to go out and visit the most vulnerable people, offer our fire prevention advice, um, fit smoke detectors, provide that intervention advice and guidance where we seem, uh, where we deem appropriate. Um, and when we go into a property, we call it a safe and well visit because we look at fire safety, but we also refer on to other agencies for specialist support, such as smoke cessation or slips, trips and falls. Um, but specifically, we go in and we look at eight things. OK, we look at the home fire detection in the property. So what detection do they have uh, and is it suitable? We look at safer heating um, and basically if it's in red, it's because I'm going to show another slide about it. But we're going to look at safer heating, electrical safety. So how they plug things in, how they charge things, how they power things, kitchens, candles and escape planning. Um, yeah, so a lot of fires start in the kitchen round about this time of year more people use candles. Clutter and hoarding related issues which is a big safeguarding issue but I'm not going to talk too much about that today. Deliberate fires that could be either a threat or it could be a young person in the property that has a fascination with fire. Medicines and medical devices and smoking related fires so they're the eight what we called core components of our safe and well visit. So let's have a look at safer heating. Um, big topic at the moment because we've got the energy crisis, cost of living and people who have low fuel security. So um, we've noticed that people are starting to change the way they heat their properties. We've had um, more people um, choosing to maybe use a chimney that they haven't used for a while or change the way that they would normally um, heat their property. So what, what makes people more at risk of a fire? So if they've got an open fire with no fire guard, or if they burn inappropriate fuel and uh, that could be the case as if you're burning logs they've got to be treated to a certain temperature and they've got to be so dry before you you end up using them people could use cheaper alternatives or just chop a tree down in the garden and use that before it's appropriately dry um, if they use a portable or halogen fire close to the furniture or to dry clothes or close to them to heat them up especially if they've got poor mobility um, if they leave flammable items too close or on top of heat sources or especially around the sort of fire and the stoves you know having nice logs piled up so it looks nice or having tinsel above the mantelpiece um, are all sort of seasonal things that we see every year and we advise around it um, if they've got an inadequately made chimney so if it's not been swept recently if there is issues with the masonry the flue or the chimney pot or if uh, over the summer a bird has chosen to make a nest there or if there's any sort of debris then could quickly have a chimney fire which can quickly cause a roof fire and ultimately property fire so um, in North Yorkshire we're actually one of the highest um, counties in the in the country that attend chimney fires I think we're third out of the entire country so it is a big issue for us and basically if there's any evidence of burn or scorch marks you know from logs falling off a fire these are near misses um, so they point to us where we think we could do some advice and education. Uh, next I want to talk about emollient cream so I'm jumping over to some medicines that we find uh, medicines and medical devices that we find to be a risk. Emollient creams you'll find them all over we've probably all got them at home so things like E45 cream is an emollient cream depending on when you got it it may not have a flammable sticker on the back or any sort of warning signs but the actual cream itself is not flammable you can't strike a match and put it in the cream it won't it won't ignite but you can get them in any form they can be paraffin non-paraffin beeswax um, basically what they do is as they are used to treat skin conditions like psoriasis and eczema they soak into your clothing they soak into other people's clothing their bedding their bed sheets their towels and it actually dries them out and it makes them more flammable. Um, the residue, even after you've washed it, remains. So you can never really fully remove it. You can reduce it a little bit. Washing at a high temperature does reduce it, but not fully remove it. And um, basically the people that are most at risk of an emollient cream related fire or having an emollient cream being a contributing factor to a, a large fire is if they smoke, if they're over 60, 
and if they have reduced mobility. And unfortunately, some of our colleagues over in West Yorkshire Fire have had some first case examples of people that have had emollient creams on their clothing, um, soaked into their clothing and have had devastating fires as a result of that. Um, so on the back of that, basically, there's a nice picture of what you may see on the back of a, a product. But it, like I say, it doesn't mean it's about the flammability of the cream. It's what it does to the clothing or bedding that it, that it catches in onto. So on the back of uh, what West Yorkshire did, they produced a video um, and it's a little bit, um, it's, it's quite a shocking video. It's nothing gory or anything like that, but I'm going to play it to you. So basically they've done a, uh, following a few incidents they've had, they've done a couple of tests, okay, they've done it in a laboratory, tested out what emollient creams do when ignited with a cigarette, um, and they've got a couple of uh, different types of t-shirts that they've soaked. Okay, I'm not going to play the entire video, just to uh, sort of keep the uh, the time down, but I want to show you at least the sort of first 30 seconds. Um, I'll keep talking through it just so that I can sort of narrate it, but um, we've got so first first test subject is a laundered clean fabric, just nothing on it. Test two, unlaundered, okay, and this was like similar to the scenes uh, 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 they found at an incident, paraffin-based contamination. Okay, test three, fabric contaminated over seven days with 70 grams of paraffin. And this is 21% paraffin content, uh, which is quite low, okay. You can get them at 0% paraffin, you can get them at water-based ones, which are much safer, but not as good for treating skin conditions. Test four, again, basically same as test three, but a high percentage of paraffin. Um, test five is one that's been washed, okay? So 21% paraffin, similar to test three, but it's been washed at 40 degrees. Um, and test six, I think, is just the 70% paraffin, but it's been washed. Yeah, I'm correct. Uh, I've obviously watched this one too many times. 74.5% paraffin and 40 degrees. So we've got a control one. We've got one that looked like uh, similar to what was found at an incident. And then we've got the 20 and the 70% and then the 20% washed and 70% washed. So what we're doing here is uh, we've got a clock started in the middle. We've got our all six subjects. And you can immediately see that the ones that have been soaked in paraffin have caught much, much quicker. Um, the ones that have been washed, they did catch quicker, but slightly less, but more than the ones that were um, one and two. Um, in a second, I think it's going to pause and it's going to show you the temperatures, but you don't really need to know the temperatures to see what your eyes are telling you. Um, yeah. 100 degrees Celsius in 30 seconds for a 21%, which is interesting because you would think that the more paraffin that would be hotter, but actually the less paraffin, the the more dangerous it is. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip past that now. Basically, uh, they all eventually get to the point where they're fully burned, but the first 30 seconds is the most impactful. Um, so going on to smoking, um, people are at increased risk of fire if they uh, smoke under the influence of drugs and alcohol because they're more likely to fall asleep or misplace or put the cigarette down somewhere where they wouldn't usually, their appetite to risk will be different. If they smoke in bed or went on medication that causes drowsiness, essentially the same thing, that it can drop. Uh, obviously, I, I don't think I've added in here, but if they smoke whilst they've got emollients, then that is also an increased use. Oh, I did. Um, smoke when using an airflow mattress, so a dynamic airflow mattress that's used to treat um, bed sores. Um, may have been prescribed or bought by them, or they've got home oxygen, so they may be on a mask or a nasal cannula. Um, either way, they shouldn't be smoking, but it is an increased risk, and they can, we have had serious flash burns because of that. So you may see uh, evidence of burn marks on clothes, furniture, uh, carpets, even burn marks on the person through careless smoking, um, overflowing ashtrays, just things like you would expect someone to be quite safety conscious with smoking but if it's not their priority if they're not aware of it or their complacency setting over a number of years then it's our job to sort of educate around that um yeah nice little picture there for you um so yeah just in the interest of times I've, I've cut the other bits out but i just wanted to talk about safer heating emollient cream specifically in terms of medicals and medical devices uh, and smoking, some of the biggest risks that we find when we're going into people's properties. And we just ask that um, if you did know anyone or if you feel like this information was useful, please pass it on. 
um, we're always open to accepting partnership referrals from our colleagues and other partnering agencies. We've got a few different referral forms. They're all found on our website. If you look under the book a safe and well visit on our website, you'll see there's two referral forms, basically one which takes you through like a little mini home risk assessment and one which does uh, for the domestic abuse and arson related fires. And that's it. So thank you very much for listening to me. I've uh, sort of kept it within time there. M maybe have one or two seconds to answer any questions, but I'll uh, leave that. Come to my, you know, in my head is for the sort of creams. It's like things like pseudocrema. They're the, you know, the things that would be used for like, you know, nappy ointment care and stuff like that. Are they the ones that will also catch fire? Because obviously, you know, parents with babies and using those sort of things, that's going to be in quite a lot of areas, isn't it? I think pseudocrem's a little bit different, uh, but I'd have to check. Um, to be honest, there's been a big national campaign that's gone out and it's not really, probably hasn't hit the end user that much, but in terms of the providers and the prescribers, it's definitely been raised quite well there. So the, the creams themselves now should all have a nice little hazard warning diamond on the back or some sort of note on the back. Um, it's just that I know that some creams people will just apply every now and then and may have an old tub in the cupboard that they haven't looked at for a while and that they might have might have missed that. It's the best the best thing to do is case by case for creams. Have a look on the back um, and you can also you know do your do your research online as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks very much. That's been really informative. Um, we haven't got any more questions in the, the chat, so you're, you're welcome to stay, uh, Adam, and uh, hear from the ne our next uh, presenters. But I'd like to now just hand over to Claire and uh, Dan from the Regional Cybercrime Unit. Thank you, Hayden. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yeah, you're coming through fine. Fantastic, and hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, indeed. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Claire Allison and I work for Yorkshire and the Home, joined by my colleague today, uh, Dan Fox. Dan works for North Yorkshire Police, but I'll let Dan introduce himself when I hand across to Dan throughout this presentation. So I just want to talk about the four P's of cyber policing. I'm going to look at why people get involved in cybercrime. What is the referral process? I want to talk through a case study and look at some resources that are available to those who have an interest within cyber. So just got a little bit of a, a quiz that, you know, please unmute yourself, please get involved. Um, I can't see the chat box. Um, so if you put it in the chat box, I'm not going to be able to see it, but please just unmute. Uh, so this is from a millennial cohort study uh, that was done with 19,000 students and they've identified that 3% of teens are likely to smoke, 2% of teens are likely to have sex, 2% of teens are likely to be in a gang. What percentage of teens do you think are likely to hack? Anybody? 10%. 10%. Not bad, not a bad one. Yeah, 5%. So they've identified that 5% of teens are likely to hack. What percentage of teens admitted to trying to compromise somebody else's account, social media, or similar? I guess a big one with this is the word admitted. Any takers for a guess? So it's 25%, one in four. This is quite a big one. So what percentage of hackers started hacking before the age of 16? All of them. <laughs> very good, very close, 61%. Yeah, 61% start hacking before the age of 16. And there we go, just giving that one away. So the average age of somebody arrested for drugs trafficking and similar is around 37. What is the average age for somebody arrested for illegal hacking, DDoSing or use of malware? I just put it into a bit of context, I promise we're not going to get technical in this presentation, um, but DDoSing stands for Distributed Denial of Service and it's basically flooding somebody else's um, computer network that it causes it to crash, just sending so many requests at once um, that it crashes and it can't physically cope. Um, that's it in its most simplest terms and malware is just another word for malicious software. So the average age for somebody arrested for illegal hacking, DDoSing and use of malware. It's us. 70. So the four P's of cyber policing. 
Uh, we're set up very similar to the counterterrorism policing unit under the 4P structure. So we've got Pursue. Pursue is a team of detectives who investigate the cybercrime offences that are reported, fire action fraud, and then they're disseminated to the local forces. Uh, when I talk about cybercrime offences, it could be anything from social media accounts being hacked um, to, to ransomware. You know, it can be literally anything that falls within cyber dependent crime. Uh, we've got protect, which is protecting individuals, businesses. This is organisations, charities um, from becoming a victim of cybercrime. And if they do become a victim, what are the steps that they can take? And then prevent, which is the area that I work within, and this is deterring people away from cybercrime. And prepare is identification for upcoming threats. So if we just talk about cyber prevent and the cyber choices programme, which is coordinated by the National Crime Agency. So the aims of the programme is to explain the difference between legal and illegal cyber activity. It's to encourage individuals to make informed choices about their use of technology. We want to deter and or divert individuals away from cybercrime. But as we know, there's lots of well-paid, exciting careers that do exist out there within cyber, uh, within that remit. So we want to support legal tech opportunities that are available to people. So you may or may not know, but the two types of cybercrime are cyber enabled and cyber dependent. Uh, the area that Dan and myself work within is within the cyber dependent. So the key difference between them is cyber enabled is a crime where you can commit it with or without the use of the technology. So if we think about credit card fraud, just a, an example, credit card fraud can be committed with or without the use of the computer without that technology. And that's where it just is cyber enabled and it enhances that offence just using the computer to do so. Cyber dependent crime is crime where you need the computer, you need that technology to be able to commit that offence. So this is things that we talked about in the little quiz at the start. So the viruses, the malware, the hacking, uh, the distributed denial of service attacks, these cannot be committed without the use of the technology. So this is why it's cyber dependent crime. So there was a report uh, it's a few years back now, uh, it was published in 2016, and they basically compared the profiles of some cyber criminals and top level penetration testers just to see what's the same, what's different and what are the causes for deviance. Uh, it has been documented that online gaming is a potential pathway into cybercrime. And I'm going to put the caveat, it's not to suggest that all online gamers will become cyber criminals, it's just a potential pathway. Uh, it's not always for financial gain. Quite often it can be for challenge and peer recognition why people get involved in cybercrime. Uh, the more likely we ha intervene, the more likely we are to have a positive outcome. And this next slide just shows the pathway. So you see the bar at the top, the blue bar talks about computer gaming, online gaming and goes all the way across um, to serious cybercrime. I'll let you look through that. And then the red bar talks about the legality. So we see at what point it's legal and where it starts to become illegal. Um, the next one, so if you look at the first green bar, it talks about like computer gaming. You still tend to have a lot of real world contacts and friends. But as you move more towards online gaming, you tend to have a lot of online contacts and friends. And you see as it goes all the way across to serious cybercrime, you know, potentially getting involved in organised crime gangs. And then the second green bar, this is where it talks about the parental and educational understanding of what's taking place. So what motivates people to get involved in cybercrime? Um, I've put a few on here, but obviously there are lots of reasons. Quite often it can be for financial gain. It can be for a joke, for a challenge. Uh, we've had it in the past where people have said, you know, I just want to test my skills. I've learned how to do this. There are so many online tools and tutorials now that will teach us basically anything. Uh, and lots of young people are watching them and, and then going off and testing the skills and seeing what they can do. Again, um, anonymity some people think because sat behind the computer screen that they're not going to get caught and on that same token they don't see the victim that they're affecting so quite often they think it's a victimless crime but obviously we know it's by no means victimless so i'm just going to talk about the computer misuse act 1990 um because this is what we would explain to people initially who get referred in you know what what are the do's and don'ts whilst online and what are the potential consequences so section one talks about an authorised access to computer material. So an example of this is shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing is exactly as it sounds, looking over somebody's shoulder. As your friend enters their, their username and password into their mobile phone, you remember their login details and later log in and read their messages without their permission. This is up to two years imprisonment and or a fine. We do deliver a lot of presentations uh, to students and quite often, uh, more often than not, young people are not aware that this is an offence. Uh, section two moves on. It talks about unauthorised access with the intent to commit or facilitate commission of further offences. This moves on from section one. So this time 
they've logged in, they've accessed your account, it's unauthorised access, but they've ordered a new uh, computer console or a new hoodie top um, using your account details and, you know, just changed it to the free address. And this is up to five years imprisonment and or a fine. Section three is an authorised access with the intent to impair or with recklessness to impair in the operation of a computer. So when we talked about the DDoS attacks, so the example here, it gives you playing an online game, but your friend is scoring higher than you. You use a boot tool to knock them offline and ultimately win the game. And this is up to 10 years imprisonment and or a fine. Section three is a day. It talks about unauthorised acts causing or creating risk of serious damage. The example it gives is you hack into the police network. This results in delays to emergency calls. Even though this was not your intention, you were reckless in your actions. And this is up to 14 years imprisonment and or a fine. But with this one, if you attack into national security or human welfare, it could potentially be a life imprisonment. And section 3A, this is making, supplying or obtaining articles for use in another computer misuse act offence. So downloading a product where you can deploy malware to a friend's computer and control it remotely. Just having this software on your computer, you would commit the offence even if you've never used it. And this is up to two years imprisonment and or fine. So other potential consequences people face will get involved in cybercrime. They can have a visit or warning from the police. They could have their devices seized. Someone's talking about devices, basically anything that connects to the internet, you know, mobile phones, laptops, gaming consoles, routers. They can have banned or limited internet usage. Could be expelled from school, not be able to get the job they want, not be able to get into college or university, not be able to travel to certain countries or potentially all of these. So cybercrime prevent a lot of what we do is going out providing that education um, you know, to, to various people, adults and young people around what is cybercrime, what are the do's and don'ts, why do people get involved in cybercrime. We also have a referral process. So if you are concerned that somebody is committing or has committed one of the computer misuse act offences that I mentioned on the previous slides, or even if you think somebody's on the cusp of committing <clears throat> these offences, then we have a referral process. <laughs> Referrals can come from anybody. A few examples listed here are teachers, social services, parents. They can come from police investigations and they can come from public events. So the referral comes in. We then ensure that they're suitable to go through cyber choices, cyber prevent, and then we will work with them. I quite often find myself saying young people here because in my experience, the majority of referrals I have received in my time here have been predominantly for young people. So the first thing we would do is ensure they've got a good knowledge and understanding of the Computer Misuse Act. Um, so that's all the offences I just went through there. Make sure they're aware of what they are, what are the do's and don'ts, and what are the consequences should you get involved or commit any of these offences. We then look at positive interventions and signpost into some resources. So how would you make a referral? So on the Yorkshire and the Humber Regional Organised Crime Unit page, under departments, there is a page for the Regional Cybercrime Unit Prevent. It's a two page form. It asks for your details and the person you're referring to details and why are you referring them? As I said before, it could be that you've heard a conversation or they've hacked into the school network. Just some examples here. All those conversations are the huge talented and we just want to make sure they're channeling uh, these talents in the right direction. There's lots of things that could warrant a referral. Um, I will share my email address at the end. And if there is ever any concerns and you're thinking, does this warrant a referral? Does it not? You know, more than happy to have a conversation and we can discuss it together. So I just want to give you an example of a case study um, of a cyber prevent referral that came in. So it was a 14 year old male was referred in because he'd hacked into the school network during COVID and caused the school network to crash. Um, how school found out that he was responsible is he had shown a friend pictures on his phone of the attack happening um, and that's how he'd been identified through school. Really good student, uh, performed, you know, performing very well. Um, school didn't want to criminalise uh, this young man, so they put in a cyber prevent referral. Um, we then went through a process making sure they're suitable to come through cyber prevent. Uh, it didn't have any offending history, wasn't known to the police for anything. So I started working with them, uh, obviously, as you saw on the previous slide, making sure they've got a good knowledge and understanding of the computer misuse act and the potential consequences should they become involved in cybercrime. And then we start looking for something that they're interested in, you know, what can what can we engage you in? What can we put your skills to use in? Um, so they're not going off looking at the raw material and potentially kind of falling down into the illegal path again. 
So we managed to get him on a Cyber Defenders course through Cyber First over the summer holidays. Uh, this was done over two weeks. Uh, it was during COVID, so it was done remotely, but, you know, thoroughly enjoyed it. And he's then gone on to do a Cyber Extended Project Qualification, um, which has been done over a two year period. Uh, he's had to write an assignment throughout that and it, you know he's submitted the work for that and you know hopefully going to get a grade so he's got potential here to pass a level three qualification um before doing his gcse's so i'm sure you know and, and i know i'm preaching to the converted you know the prevent is provided all around providing that education that guidance and those resources and obviously not criminalizing young people so some of the things we try to promote to young people are that you know if you have got an interest in this within cyber within tech within it there are loads of well-paid exciting careers out there i've put a few in here but you know young people are interested in games development you know you can turn this into a career if you want to enjoy online gaming you know you can get paid to do this develop games ethical hackers so those young people like to test the skills like to beat the system see what they can do there's companies that will employ you to kind of beat their systems and fix it before the cyber criminal finds it and software engineers, so young people enjoy coding, problem solving, again, another well-paid exciting career available. Uh, again, I've listed some interventions and resources on here. Uh, th these can all be shared with you after. Uh, and again, obviously, th this is just a few. The, the list is huge. There's lots available out there. People with an interest. Uh, one thing I'm sorry to touch on, I uh, don't know if you've heard of it, but Cyber Explorers is available. Uh, it's completely free. Uh, schools can sign up and then uh, sign students up. Uh, you can see there it's just a simple browser based learning platform um, it's text media activity it's got a no fail environment and it's got lots of little cyber security concepts and they're put into everyday scenarios on there and so schools can sign students up to this um, there's lesson plans uh, that go with it um, yes yeah, so it's quite good if anybody does want the details of this you know again i'll share it on an email after the links to the referral form uh, some information about cyber explorers and some of the resources uh, that I've touched on. But that's it from me. Um, thank you very much for listening. I don't know if there are any questions, but if there isn't, I will hand you on to my colleague Dan Fox from North Yorkshire Police. Hello. Right. So um, as um, Claire said there, uh, there are a fair, um, but as part of uh, North Yorkshire Police, we are dual hatted. Um, my colleague um, Liam Carter, who's not on the, the call today because he's on a, a course, also does the same thing. So we are both protect and prevent officers. Um, we are tasked with going out into the community um, and whereas prevent is more about the individual and making sure we deviate them away from criminal activity, protect is far more about the wider public and keeping people safe online. Um, so we go into the community and we deliver this presentation that I'm just about to show you now. Um, we do it in a couple of different ways. Um, we can do it as a stand-up presentation like it is now, um, but we are also, we have developed um, a, a cyber escape room, um, which basically puts you in the shoes of a detective um, and you can uh, get this sort of guidance and in a more interactive uh, interactive way. But fundamentally, the information given in the cyber escape room is the same as what you'll get through this presentation. So in this now, <coughs> we telling you how to protect your accounts, how to protect devices and data and how to deal with suspicious messages that you might get. Um, scam, spam, we all get these these messages um, through emails. So the first point is to create a separate password for your email. Your email is the gateway to your online accounts. So if, as, if your uh, email address is safe and secure, then nobody can get access to all of your other accounts. Um, so we recommend that you use a, a, a single strong password for your email ad account and you never use that for any other account. So if anybody gets access to your email account, then they can't get into anything else, basically. In terms of creating strong passwords, current guidance says that you should use three random dictionary words strung together. Um, that gives the less, less likelihood that uh, a computer is going to crack it. Um, you can pick any three words, any three words that you like. They might have a meaning for yourself. Um, I, my password does. It's free random words to anybody else, but to me it means something. <laughs> um, but if you uh, if you do that, then obviously that gives you a, a head start against uh, against somebody trying to access your accounts. Point three: saving your passwords in browsers. Um, a lot of people frown on this, um, but it is a recommendation. Um, 
we recommend that each account that you hold has a separate password, completely different to the other one. Obviously, trying to remember all those passwords is a bit of a horrific um, undertaking sometimes. But with password managers, which are a separate independent application you can buy or within your browser, if it's your computer and you're the only one who accesses it, then there's no issue with you saving those passwords. And if it means that you can have separate passwords for each account. Number four, we turn on two step verification. Uh, we also call it two factor authentication, which is where you log into a website and it sends you a PIN number or it sends you a code um, via either your text message uh, or email, uh, which again is another reason why securing your email address is important because if somebody gets into your email address, they can access these codes and change passwords on your other accounts. Um, yep, so turning that on, especially for your email address, um, I'm conscious that there's probably a lot of businesses within on the call today um, and it is something that you can do within a business setting as well. Um, updating your devices, every device you've got, make sure that it's up to date. Um, the best way that people get into your accounts is finding flaws um, in devices and software uh, and if it's not up to date then it's not got the, the most up to date patches um, which will help keep your devices safe and secure. As I said, cyber criminals can exploit weaknesses within the software uh, in order to access your uh, your devices. Turn on backups. So we'll all have um, cloud storage somewhere. If you've got an Apple phone, you've got an Apple iCloud. Everything's automatically stored to the to the cloud. Um, this is kind of more of a an after the fact thing. If you have been hacked and you've got an up to date backup, then you can revert back to that backup in order to save your data so you don't lose all the data that you that you're being given. In terms of dealing with suspicious emails and text messages, um, there is guidance. A lot of people um, tend to just delete it and ignore it, which is fine. It works. Um, but the National Cyber Security Center, which we get all of our information and everything that we've have gone through today comes from them. Um, they have a, a dedicated. Way of doing it. So in terms of spotting what we call phishing scams, uh, they generally come with some sort of authority in them. Um, a lot of them come from uh, .gov or they'll come from your bank. There's a sense of urgency in the, the messages that you're being sent. Um, you need to do this by this day, otherwise you know, you're going to lose out or it'll cost you more money. There's some sort of emotion. They pull on your heartstrings in some way. It's a friend um, who's who needs help scarcity so it, it's preying on people who are looking for that really rare thing uh, they've got it give us your details and you can have it uh, and then current events um, we all saw during covid with the the fake uh, spam text messages about um, getting your covid jab and paying for them and uh, a lot of people fell for that one so in terms of if you get spam uh, suspicious messages don't use any of the links within those messages um, if you think it's genuine, then go to the website for the company. If it's Amazon that have sent you a message, then go to Amazon, contact them. Or if it's your bank, again, go through the bank's website and use the bank's phone numbers. Never click on the link in the message. Uh, use contact details that you can trust. Uh, and like I said, if it's we have had more prevalence at the moment with people who are accessing social media accounts and then sending messages to people within their contact lists and saying I'm stuck in such and such a place and then asking for money. If that's the sort of situation that you have and you know that person, then ring them. Just confirm that it is actually them and that their account hasn't been hacked. If you do get suspicious emails, uh, the NCSC recommend forwarding them to report at phishing.gov.uk. Um, unfortunately, North Yorkshire Police don't have the resources to, to look into every phishing email uh, website, but through the NCSE, they do have uh, a lot more resources than we do. If you get text messages, you can forward those to 7726. That sends it to your network provider. They'll probably ask you a few questions about it um, and what uh, information that you've got, phone numbers and stuff, and then they'll take it from there. And then again, it goes through to the NCSE. Um, if you've already responded, um, you can report it through on Action Fraud. Um, Action Fraud Police um, 
if you have already gone through and you've given bank details and you've lost money or you're scared of giving money, then obviously you need to contact your bank. Uh, and there's the Citizen Advice Bureau on there as well that can give um, can give some decent uh, information around that. And obviously we've got police. Ultimately, it's a crime. You know, if you've been defrauded of money, then you can contact your local police force um, on 101 uh, and report it to us. And yeah, so that's the basic advice that we that we go through in terms of protect. Um, we do that in the community. Like I said, we go out and do it. Um, we give it, do it as, as part of leaflet. People that can help after an attack and can help secure um, secure your accounts uh, and your networks. Uh, and we recommend the PCA as well, which is the Police Cyber Alarm, which uh, can um, it's a, an application that sits on your firewall um, and it helps um, after you've had an attack, being able to isolate where it was and, and trying to get an offender uh, brought to justice. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much from me. Uh, if there are any uh, any questions or anything like that, then like I said, I'll happily answer. Um, if not, then uh, I'll hand back over. Uh, there is a question uh, in the chat from Thornton Watless about, uh, you mentioned leaflets. Yeah. And are these available to share with parents? Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, it it it's nationally um, sorted advice. So it, on the NCSE website, all the, all the information that we use is on there. So you can refer them to that or yet yeah, we do have copies of of all of the information that we that we talk about um to be able to give out to to anybody yeah yeah not a problem that's brilliant uh, and is there any specific advice that you would give to because we've got a lot of schools on uh you know on the line today is there any specific advice that you would give in relation to um cyber crime and you know how you know uh, prevention things that might be specific for schools yeah. Sorry, go on. Our, our, our tips to engage with parents as well. That might be another area. Yeah, well, we're we're always looking. I mean, that's one of my colleagues' job is to engage with with everybody, really. So, sort of parents and schools. I mean, from a school point of view, um, the best thing that they can do is is speak to companies like the NEBRC who can help look at their network and make sure that that's secure. If that's secure, then from our point of view, it's just education in terms of education of the, the staff, because most of what we see tends to be ransomware attacks where somebody gets into your network, they take it over and then they ask for money from you um, in order to release your data. And that normally comes from somebody clicking on a link in a phishing email, which then allows access to, to the network. So it's about educating the staff and making sure that they they are aware, you know, their passwords are strong uh, and they're doing all the things that we recommend. If they are, then we're less likely. And obviously, if they're more likely to spot a, a spam email, then that's probably the, the, the best way to do it. But yeah, we can we can come into any school within North Yorkshire. We're North Yorkshire based, so we can do any talk in any school. Um, to teachers um, but like I said we are prevent as well so we can come into a school and give prevent advice to the students and then protect advice to the teachers it's it's not a problem at all. That's absolutely fantastic um, thank you both for, very much for your presentations uh, they're just linking in with uh, that I just want to uh, draw everybody's attention to the NYSCP website hopefully that will be just about to pop up on your screen any second um, but on our website, we actually have a parents and carers page and uh, on that uh, that page, we actually have information about games, consoles, smart devices and how to keep children safe, but also advice for parents about keeping children safe, uh, you know, in well uh, clubs and on all of that sort of stuff, but also uh, online safety information is available for you from our uh, website. Can everybody see that by the way, Cause, or is it not coming through? Yes. You can see that, that's brilliant. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much uh, everybody for your uh, presentations there. Um, the last thing is obviously just want to draw your attention to uh, the key links for the website. Uh, obviously, we have a contact us page if you need to get in contact us. But our main uh, page is safeguardingchildren.co.uk. Uh, we have our Twitter uh, feed, which is um, NYSCP1. Um, hopefully, that you know will uh, continue. But we don't know what's happening with Twitter at the moment. It's a very unstable platform. Um, our Facebook page as well. We have uh, information. We publish information through there. Uh, which again is NYSCP1, 
um, there's our YouTube channel. This video will go up onto YouTube. And so please do uh, subscribe to that because it does help us out. We have Instagram as well. And we also have um, our podcast, which we'll be looking to do uh, more of those in the future as well. So uh, please uh, you know, visit our anchor uh, .fm uh, page and you'll be able to access all of the podcasts uh, that we've got there. Um, thank you everybody um, for uh, your pres presentation today and for uh, coming up.